From Daily Trust News Center, this is the News Hour. On News Hour tonight, Governor El Rufai raises alarm on insecurity, says terrorism in the Northwest is a threat to the 2023 elections and population census. Makes fortunes for APC as Binani quits APC Presidential Campaign Council and court dismisses suit against Kaduna APC governorship candidate. Government distributes relief items to Zamfara flood victims as Bielsa State replies humanitarian affairs minister. And on the foreign scene, 89-year-old Paul Bia set for 40th anniversary as Cameroon president. Hello and welcome to Trans TV News Hour. I am Ibrahim Youssef. We begin in Kaduna State, where the governor, Nasser Ahmed El Rufai, says the insurgency in the Northwest presents a clear danger to the holding of the 2023 elections and census, if not nipped in the bud. The governor is therefore advocating for the establishment of a Northwest Theatre Command, which will enable a holistic approach to counterinsurgency operations across the affected states. The governor made the statement shortly after receiving second and third security situation report in the state from the Commissioner of Internal Security and Home Affairs, Samuel Arwan. Governor Nasrul Rifai explained that the state government will continue to do everything within its powers to enhance security. According to him, the security challenges in the north requires establishing theater command to counter insurgency operations in the region. He added that the insecurity in the Northwest presents a clear danger to the conduct of 2023 elections. That lesson and the continued nature of the cross-state operations of these criminals informs the view of the Kaduna state government that a theater command similar to the one in place in the Northeast is required. Effective security operations in the seven states of the Northwest and Niger State, which have continuous and contiguous forest ranges, require this approach. It is our opinion that the insurgency in the Northwest today is not only more serious than what exists in the Northeast, but presents a clear danger to the holding of the 2023 elections and national census, if not nipped in the bud now. Information and Culture Minister Lai Muhammad explained that the Nigerian military has what it takes to handle the security situation in the country, saying the security alert issued recently by the United States of America was unnecessary. And I want to say very categorically and without mincing words that whatever has been the intention of this security alert or this travel advisory, what it has done is that it has terrorized our people and has set the nation in a panic mode. No doubt, the American government has the right to issue travel advisories to citizens, but that should not go to the extent of scaremongering. Kaduna State Commissioner for Internal Security and Home Affairs, Samuel Arwan, while presenting his quarterly security report, said no fewer than 161 people were killed and 804 kidnapped in the last three months due to bandit activities in the state. Now, in total, in first quarter, we lost 285 lives. Two seven one males, twelve females, and two minors. And uh, the areas where we still have uh, challenges, especially in Brininguari, and uh, bearing in mind the Brininguari, Maganda, Funtua axis, we are working to improve the situation in that general area. What we will not do is to go back into the past where criminal elements establish roadblocks and collect tolls and levies from commuters that apply that road. The road is free now. We have cleared the obstruction. Kaduna State is one of the states in the Northwest battling banditry, 
and with terror groups occupying ungoverned spaces in Birningwari Forest and other locations. Bella Musa, Cross TV News Kaduna. And to politics now, where presidential candidate of the new Nigeria People's Party, Rabiu Kwankwasu, says no government with the intention of impacting the lives of its people can continue subsidizing fuel, costing trillions of naira. Kwankwasu said this in an exclusive interview with Trust TV against the background of his recently released blueprint if elected as president. Trust TV's Shafiu Suleiman reports. Speaking on his stance on the raging debate around subsidy removal, the NMPP presidential candidate says there is no point sustaining the current subsidy regime in the country where the citizens are living in an excruciating poverty and growing despondency. You see, we are very clear on the issue of fuel subsidy. One, we realize that there is too much corruption involved on the issue of subsidy. Too much of it. Now that's our first place of call. We have to stop corruption, not only in, the, in that aspect of oil uh, industry, but in all areas, in the oil and in government, in the, everywhere in our lives, we have to stop it. He says if elected president next year, he will return the country back to the people whom he said met the few elite who are milking the country dry. He says such is aligned with the Concursia ideology, which is an extension of the Amini Colonel disposition about governance. You don't have to borrow money from China or from anywhere to do road. I'm a civil engineer. I spent 17 years of my civil service on dams, on roads, and other construction sites. So it's not a, a nuclear science that uh, somebody has to go and ask uh, uh, either Israel or somewhere, uh, Britain or somewhere to tell you this is a road constructing of roads. While emphasizing the need to invest in and empower the people, Konkosu says his administration will prioritize local content in addressing the huge infrastructure deficit, thereby reducing poverty and unemployment in the country. Many countries, like I want some African countries, they are calling Chinese to do there because probably they don't have strong people to do it. In Nigeria, we have people who can do all sorts of facilities and infrastructure and then wait for uh, a, a, a time to collect their money. The NMPP presidential candidate, who is among the top contenders for the nation's top job, was a two-time governor of one of Nigeria's most popular states, Kano. A former deputy speaker of the House of Representatives, a former minister of defense, among several others. Shapiro Suleiman, Trust TV News. And the All Progressives Congress crisis in Adamawa State is deepening. As the state coordinator of the Presidential Campaign Committee, Senator Aisha Binani, stepped down on Friday. Binani is the senator representing Adamawa Central, but her candidacy as APC governorship flag bearer was recently annulled by the courts. She said her decision to step down was influenced by some party members who had resorted to attacking some critical stakeholders. Silas Lowen has more. Some party members, especially former Governor Murtala Nyaku, and some critical stakeholders of the party had recently suffered personal attacks. Senator Binani says the attacks and the disposition of some party members who initiated them were unacceptable which is why she is stepping down as the coordinator Bola Ahmed Tinumbu Presidential Campaign Committee in Adamawa. It will be recalled that the leadership of the party had on Wednesday distanced itself from the purported Adamawa State Presidential Campaign Council membership list, which the party said had been in circulation on social media and some national dailies for some days. When inquired by the party, it was also confirmed that our members of the National Assembly, State Assembly, candidates, and critical stakeholders were not consulted either. It will be recalled that the National Presidential Campaign Council contacted the party at the national level for necessary input and final approval before the campaign secretariat released the list. Although she steps aside as the Adamawa State Tinibu Shatima campaign coordinator pending the outcome of the appeal court case filed, 
Many are not convinced that the appointment of Martins Babali to serve as the Adamawa interim campaign coordinator for Tinimbu Shatima is a solution to the crisis rocking the party. We should allow women also, because it's the women that did everything. We are the one that helps the men in time of campaign and everything. It's only the women that you can see everywhere and the youth. We help them to do campaign. We bring them to the seat. But when it comes to the time of a woman to contest an election, they will say she's a woman. She cannot do this. She cannot do that. It's not proper. It's firm to say that the government is mandate is not to act through the back door. Minani's mandate is a mandate for every woman and all women should arise to protect the mandate. In as much as we are law abiding and respect our court of law, we are calling on the higher court to do justice in the case without fear or favor. Senator Aisha Tubinani had defeated Nuhuri Badu, pioneer EFCC chairman, among other contestants during the party's primary election before the Federal High Court nullified her candidacy. From Yola, Silas Lawan, Trust TV News. Meanwhile, a federal high court sitting in Kaduna has dismissed a suit by APC governorship aspirant Mahmoud Saini Shaban, challenging the emergence of Senator Obasani as Kaduna state governorship candidate of the APC. The presiding judge, Justice Muhammad Garba Umar, delivered the judgment on Friday, said the court lacks jurisdiction to deliver judgment on the said matter. The report. The court, according to the ruling, declined hearing the suit as it has no jurisdiction to entertain the suit which should have been filed in Abuja. Counsel to Basani and the APC speak. The, the court decided to agree that there is no jurisdiction because the, court, the case was filed contrary to the provision of the law. So therefore the entire case is struck out. That's what happened. We contested the suit and uh, we filed several grounds of objection to the jurisdiction of the court. And then uh, also uh, the main uh, suit itself, we filed the necessary processes challenging uh, the locals of the plaintiff to file the suit in the first instance. And the judge in his wisdom in delivering his uh, ruling to our objections uh, stated that if just one of the of several objections that we have raised succeeds, there will be no need to go into the other objections. And uh, one of them succeeded, and that ended the, the matter. On his part, the counsel to Mahmoud Sanisha Abanjo Michelia reacted to the judgment. Um, like we always say, well, ours is to, to present, the judges to decide. But the good thing about uh, the judicial system is it doesn't end in the trial court. There's an avenue to go upstairs, that's to the court of appeal, to test this decision, to see whether this, the, the, the judge was right. And if the court of appeal think that uh, the decision is faulty or wrong in law, they will set it aside and do the need for So, personally, as a lawyer, definitely because I argued it, I told him it had jurisdiction, and, uh, because the effect, and the cause of action, the effect, is within Kaduna. So personally, I, 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 I feel that uh, um, they should have decided otherwise. But. It could be recalled that Mahamud Sani Shaban had filed a case challenging the legality of the emergence of Ubasani as governorship candidate of the APC, alleging that the party primary election was conducted without legal and due delegates. Mela Musa, Trust TV News Kaduna. River State Governor Nisam Wiki has increased the number of special assistants to him on political unit affairs from the initial 100,000 to 200,000 persons. Governor Wiki announced the new figure while inaugurating the second batch of the first 100,000 special assistants from Rivers, Rivers East Senatorial District at the Adoki Amisia Maka Stadium, Omagua, in Ikweri Local Government Area on Friday. The governor explained that he had been inundated with requests from Rivers people who appealed to be considered for the appointment. Governor Wiki therefore directed all political leaders of the various local government areas to return home to search for trustworthy people among the lot who they consider can help the state retain its position in the Committee of States. 
Governor Wike further said that the appointment aligns with his declaration on the day the Rebisi flyover was inaugurated to begin implementation of the policy of stomach infrastructure. The National Emergency Management Agency, NEMA, has distributed 370.5 tons of assorted grains to the Zamfara state government. Director General Mustafa Ahmed handed over the relief materials to the Zamfara state deputy governor, Senator Hassan Nasiha, in Kuso on Friday for onward distribution to the most vulnerable persons and flood victims in the state. The report. The Director of Finance, Sani Jiba, is representing the Director General of NEMA at this ceremony in which 370.5 tons of grains and relief items are being handed over. These include 166 tons of maize, 142 tons of sorghum ore, and 62.5 tons of millet, 1,000 bags each of rice and beans, 75 bags of salt, and cartons of tomato paste seasoning cubes and vegetable oil. He says the grains were part of the 12,000 tons of assorted food items from the National Strategic Reserve stock, released by the federal government for distribution to 36 states of the Federation and Federal Capital Territory. NEMA also presented non-food items where 8,000 units of nylon mats, 1,000 insecticide-treated mosquito nets, cartons of bathing soap, 2,500 pieces of guinea brocade, 1,000 pieces of wares, each for women, men, and children, among other items. Heavily being led by our sister, our mother, Hajia Saadia Umar Paruk, to deliver relief materials on behalf of the federal government of Nigeria to the victims of the recently flood disaster, and at the same time, uh, for grains distribution to persons that are vulnerable, that has been released from the strategic reserve by the federal government. The deputy governor of Zamfara State, while receiving the items on behalf of the state government, thanked the federal government for the timely intervention. Let me begin by extending our profound appreciation to the Federal Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs, Disaster Management and Social Deployment, and of course, the National Emergency Management Agency for this support and many other numerous intervention programs in Zamfara State. The Emir of Guso, Ibrahim Bello, appreciate the federal government for the gesture to the vulnerable persons in the state. We are very grateful for this assistance given to our people. They say what is worth doing is worth doing well. And we are very proud of our daughter, who very much cares about what, what is happening in her environment. The federal government has admitted that these items cannot adequately compensate for the traumatic experiences of persons affected by disaster or alleviate their sufferings. This is why it is important that these items get to the people who need them. In this vein, the state's deputy governor, Senator Hassan Nasiha, has warned that any official caught diverting the relief materials in the course of distributing them to the beneficiaries will be prosecuted. Similarly, the National Emergency Management Agency, NEMA, has distributed relief materials to 37,000 households affected by flood in Borno State. The Deputy Director of Human Resources, Mohammed Kanar, presented the items on behalf of the NEMA Director General, Mustafa Habib Ahmed, in Maiduguri. The Deputy Director said the items are not meant to compensate the severe effect of the flood on the victims, but to cushion the negative impact. Director General, Borno State Emergency Management Agency, Yabawa Kolo, commended President Mohammed Buhari and NEMA for their prompt support to the state. She said the gesture would go a long way in alleviating the sufferings of the victims, saying the 2022 flood affected about 37 households in the state. The Bielsa state government has faulted the federal government's claim that the state is not one of the top 10 states affected by the recent flooding recorded in many parts of the country. Humanitarian Affairs and Disaster Management Minister Saidiya Farouk on Thursday said Jigawa was the most affected state and that Bielsa was not in the top 10. 
She said she made the remark in reaction to claims by elder statesman and leader of the Pan Niger Delta Forum, Chief Edwin Clark, who implored the federal government to act to save flood victims in the Niger Delta and not to abandon them. The minister said the criteria used to arrive at the conclusion were based on the following indices the number of deaths recorded and displaced persons per state, number of injuries, partially damaged houses houses totally damaged, and farmlands partially and totally damaged. However, in a statement on Friday, the Bielsa State Commissioner for Information and Strategy, Ayiba Duba, faulted the minister's source of data. You're watching Trust TV News Hour. And still to come. We answer the question, are pets man's best friend? For the answer to this and so much more. After the break, do stay with us. interest bank like no other. That's because we do not just share in your success story, but we also share your risk like it's ours. And that's why we say at Taj Bank, our only interest is you. There is danger looming everywhere, not only affecting us, but affecting the whole country. Ni at least they na was a iri buhu go ma na chingaba. Ruan bini oyazo ya mama ye na na lo dokuma yazo ya kara. Tawtai asara taraba tai asara. Most of the flood we are seeing is a fingerprint of climate change. We are having rainfall uncertainty. The real person that's supposed to know and avert its effect is left in the doom. Akwe Madalang Abinti, Ajah Taraba, Ama Nigeria. Welcome back and thanks for staying with us on Trust TV News Hour. Now let's recap our top stories. Governor El Rufai raises alarm on insecurity, says terrorism in the Northwest is a threat to the 2023 elections and population census. And mixed fortunes for APC as Binani quits APC Presidential Campaign Council and court dismisses suit against APC Kaduna governorship candidate. And moving on to other news now, a federal high court in Abuja has ordered an interim forfeiture of 40 landed properties belonging to a former Deputy Senate President, Senator Ike Ekwaramadu, who is currently in custody in the United Kingdom. Justice Iyang Ekwo made the order following an ex parte motion by the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC. The judge ordered the FCC to publish the interim forfeiture order of the properties in a national daily within seven days from the date the order was given. The interim forfeiture order covers 10 of the Equerimadu's properties in Enugu, three in the United States of America, two in the United Kingdom, one in Lagos, nine in Dubai, and 15 located in the federal capital territory. 
Justice Echo subsequently adjourned till December 5th, 2022 for a report if there is any objection from any member of the public regarding the properties. And about six women have been killed after being crushed by a tipper truck in the outskirts of Maiduguri. The incident, which occurred on Friday morning along Gubio Road at Kaswan Fara, residents said the truck lost brake control and rammed into a pickup truck conveying women to the farm. The accident triggered an angry mob to set the truck ablaze. I was passing by. I saw people gathered that there was an accident. I saw bodies in vehicles being taken towards that direction to the hospital. They said about six people died and that was why they burnt down the trucks. Meanwhile, fire has gutted a section of the National Youth Service Corps headquarters in Abuja, the nation's capital. The incident happened on the third floor of a six-story building edifice on Friday with no loss of life. It can never, however, be ascertained if documents were lost to the inferno. A statement on Friday by the Corps Director of Press and Public Relations, Eddie Megwa, said no life was lost in the sudden fire outbreak adding that the fire was immediately put out by the Federal Capital Territory and Federal Fire Service Departments. The affected floor is occupied by planning, research and statistics and the General Service Department, with the fire affecting only a particular room with electronic gadgets. A suspected vandal has been electrocuted in the Kalashi community of Kanki local government area of Plateau State. The electrocuted suspect was said to have attempted to vandalize the transformer of the Kalashi distribution substation where he was electrocuted. Head of Corporate Communications of the Joss Electricity Distribution Company, Friday Elijah, in a statement, said the matter was reported to the Kanke Police Divisional Office where some personnel of the division went to evaluate the corpse. In a related development, four suspects were also arrested by members of the public in various communities in Bochi, while vandalizing electricity facilities. These suspects, who have been handed over to law enforcement agencies, had succeeded in cutting four core armored cables before they were apprehended. Now, rented crowds at political rallies are a common phenomenon during electioneering in Nigeria. People are often induced with gifts and monetary promises to form a large crowd at political campaign venues. In this report, Bella Musa speaks to analysts who are of the opinion that political crowd renting only promotes thuggery and un undermines democratic growth in the country. The report. Rented crowd is when one hires people to form a large crowd at the political rally, protests, or other public events. Individuals are often attracted to attend political rally by inducing them with money or other gifts to create a large crowd for a particular candidate or political party. Many, however, believe rented crowd is a deceit and setback to the growth of democracy. So usually such crowds, to me, to my own understanding, is deceit. Uh, they, are, they rented the crowd to deceive the people. Yes. You will find out, especially if people are disenchanted, they will not like to come to that political event. So what will they do? Is to rent, is to sponsor people to come, and at the end of the day, you see, you see them giving people one thousand naira, five hundred naira. Some believe that unless leadership recruitment process is addressed, Nigerians will continue to witness renting of crowd, vote buying, and other irregularities in the electoral process. So we should have a leader that is bold enough to stand up. That's why I said earlier on, to unite the people. We have to address the leadership question in Nigeria. Unless we address it now, it will boomerang in the near future. Because the army of unemployed youths I'm seeing around is disturbing. We have almost a near collapse system. If you look at our education, if you look up, uh, about health. In Electoral Act 2022 as amended, it comes with a lot of, uh, a lot of provisions. 
And those provisions that the Electoral Act come with uh, provide for a certain level of punishment for people who, most especially Togri, vote buying, uh, uh, renting crowd to be part of political activities. I think the Electoral Act has taken care of that. What needed to be done is for the government to follow it up to implement those Electoral Act. I think the police or rather the security agencies should be able to work assiduously in ensuring that they carry out the responsibility as assigned to them by the con uh, Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. As campaigns gather momentum, some unemployed may be bracing up for opportunity to be paid at political rallies, though voter has admonished not to allow money to influence their choice of political leaders in 2023. Bella Musa, Trust TV News Kaduna. And following the sack of some communities by flood in River State recently, the state chapter of the Nigeria Medical Association have taken medical outreach to Ahoda East local government in order to forestall the outbreak of diseases. A report. Speaking during the medical outreach at the internally displaced camp in support of the flood victims, chairman of NMA River State, Dr. A.B. Robinson, said they were able to gather over 100 doctors to the IDP camps to give free medical treatment to people. There are over 5,000 persons right in this camp that are on the queue, documented to be attended to. We have already developed over 500 children right here with albendazole, and then we're giving them food and drink to support the drug that has already been administered. That's what we've already done. So we are fully on ground with all form of medications that might relate to a camp. As if we are looking into communicable diseases, respect to this, and some of that have some other non communicable diseases, we are also going to treat and give them the required medication. Dr. Robinson commended the state government for its prompt response to the flawed victims and called for improvement at the IDP camps within the state. From the time we came for our first finding mission and now, the Flood Victim Intervention Task Force have done a lot. We saw a lot of differences. Although there is room for improvement, but they've done very well. So I want to thank His Excellency Chief by Science of Isabel Wiki. Some of the beneficiaries expressed the light for the free medical outreach. They have done well because our recent cases here has been come. I hope. Those people that sit here, they will be okay. Yeah, I complain of uh, waist pain and uh, this my ribs. On behalf of the camp, I want to sincerely thank the uh, enemy for this uh, quick response to my people. As we come here, no need to we can give us. Yesterday night, they share one part of a yam, two person one. Uh, the one. Over 2,000 internally displaced persons benefited from the free medical treatment. Now, there has been an ongoing debate over allowing non-state actors, particularly community-based security outfits, to complement the efforts of conventional security agencies. The Benue State Community Volunteer Guards was launched to replace the hitherto vigilante groups. Jimmy Adzandi examines the arguments and files in this report. The Otom-led government disbanded the vigilante groups, replacing them with the community volunteer guards. The first phase of the guards was launched in August with a second batch in October 2022. So far, the guards spread across the 23 local government areas of the states are trying hard in fighting crimes. But the big challenge is addressing the farmer header crisis. In my capacity as the uh, state commander, of the Benue State Committee Volunteer Guard, I am also appealing that the federal government should approve the request of our state governor, Dr. Samuel Oton, by uh, approving for us uh, the use of uh, automatic weapons so that we will be able to combat or face these bandits uh, with equal force. The residents of Benue State, some of them victims of the criminal attacks on communities, express misreactions on granting of certain categories of weapons to the guards. The attackers carry AK-47. So you expect them to carry bows and arrows? It doesn't make sense. So, but of course, this is a democracy. It calls for discussion, for lobbying, 
for you know dialoguing you know so i need for, for me it is proper that the state government set up this security outfits because the first tax of government is protection of lives and property of the people the recruitment of these guards followed a careful process that involved community leaders and the traditional rulers in their respective domains. Community guards that were specially selected in consultation with the traditional rulers in Benue State. We had a hand in their selection and we can say something about their character. And these are people that were specially trained. And we look forward that they will work together with conventional forces to guard the state to provide the needed security. There is relative calm in communities across the state, but the head of former fascists have continued. The security outfit said it can end the persistent attacks on rural dwellers if well armed. People keep pets for different reasons, some just for the love of animals and others for the health benefits attached to it. In this report, Noel Samson examines the different reasons why people in Nigeria keep pets. Keeping a pet at home has been practiced from prehistoric times to the present and as pets are found in nearly every culture and society. Pet keeping apparently satisfies a deep and universal human need. In Nigeria, like other parts of the world, people do keep pets, but what are the reasons? Some as um, companions at home, as they have something to play with or interact with, some for security reasons. I think people keep pets because uh, at times it's pets are emotional support animals. Okay, they behave as humans. And actually, I grew up with pets around me, so I can't see any reason why people should not have pets. I think people keep pets so as to... Okay, for instance, people keep dogs so they help them exercise. I have a neighbor who goes out with his dog every day, so I believe the dog accompanies it. Sometimes the dog runs and the neighbor runs after the dog. Why some people are animal lovers, others have different opinions on keeping animals at home as pets. Okay, one of the reasons I hate pets is because when I was growing up, my mom used to have these cats, very annoying cats. The cat pulls on my bed. I, I don't like I don't like cats, I don't like dog, I don't like pets generally. Personally, I don't like pets because some of them might be dirty, some of them the way they be doing, I, will, I don't like keeping, I don't like seeing them, especially when you see pet dog, uh, all those cats at home. I don't like the way they play around. However, there are many health benefits attached to owning pets. They can increase opportunity to exercise and socialize. It also gives people opportunity to have regular walks. And with pets, we can decrease blood pressure and cholesterol level. Noel Samson, Trust TV News, Abuja. Still watching Trust TV News Hour. The news continues after this break. Do stay with us. Documenting the Nigerian story.
Welcome back and thanks for staying with us on Trust TV News Hour. The Senate Committee on Appropriation has issued an ultimatum to its various committees to submit their reports to its appropriation department on or before November 11, 2022. This mandate follows the approval of a timetable for the consideration of the 2023 appropriation bill released by the chairman of the Senate Committee on Appropriation, Senator Barrow Jibril. Senator Jibril told Senate correspondents that lawmakers are purposeful, focused and determined to accelerate the passage of the 2023 appropriation bill of 20.5 trillion naira before the end of December. We are supposed to receive the reports of uh, the Committee on Capital Markets this morning as well as that of Cooperation Integration in Africa, Downstream Petroleum Resources Committee, Upstream Petroleum Resources Committee, and Committee on Gas. But unfortunately, none of them is here. The Chairman, Revenue Mobilization, Allocation and Fiscal Commission, Mohamed Bello, has given the Commission's clarification on the proposed salary review for political office holders in the country. The Commission's recent announcement on upward review of salaries of political office holders amidst rising inflation and economic hardship has generated criticisms. To carry out the exercise. In fact, the process has started. The President has directed us to accept a report that was given to the Attorney General of the Federation as far as the salary of judicial officers is concerned. I'm sure you are aware there was a lawsuit recently where some people took the federal government to court or the federation to court on the salaries of judicial officers. So the president directed the commission to work on it. The report was forwarded to us. So in line with the way we want to look at it, we will look at comprehensive review. Review does not mean we are increasing. Review does not mean we are reducing. Review does not mean we are leaving it the way it is. We will analyze it scientifically, look at it, and come up with our decision based on all the scientific data that is available to us. And still on the economy, the Naira has been struggling against the value of the dollar, resulting in skyrocketing prices of goods and services. Despite policies made by the central bank, several factors are contributing to the Naira's volatile nature. Chamun Dabeng explores the reasons for its recent fall against the dollar. The Naira opened this year trading in the parallel market at 517 Naira to the dollar. Today the figure has risen to 815 Naira to the dollar. The Naira, which was already struggling, has now collapsed even further just a week after the central bank announced plans to redesign the three major denominations. However, is this to blame? And could Nigeria be looking at a further drop? It's going to go higher. The reason why this is happening is because of the change of currency. And what is happening now is that for the fear of people not being able to use the currency now in the future, they are moving to dollar, a more usable currency, a universally accepted currency. Following the announcement, some experts had speculated that the downward trend in the strength of the Naira will stabilize. However, Dr. Audu has a different take on the matter. There's what they call the speculative demand for money. People buy to speculate. Oh, what's going to happen tomorrow? Is the market going to be good? Ugh. Now, that's what's going on now. The speculation, the demand for dollar is driven by speculation. So, maybe after the currency has been changed, people, some people just say, why should I even change to Naira? Let me just leave my currency in dollar. It's universal accepted. And that is where... It remain. There is an urgent need for a sustainable solution. Yeah, the suspension of uh, uh, CDN intervention of Forex to BDC is also one of the contributory factors of this uh, Naira fall. So we plead with the government 
to find a way of uh, seeing how they can resume and continue with the intervention exercise. Why do we demand dollar? We have a food import bill of five billion dollars. We are always buying things abroad. That needs to stop. We need to look inwards. We need to look at other sectors. We need to put money in the agricultural sector to revive the agricultural sector to begin to export so that we will shore up our own reserves and have more dollars. The basic infrastructures has to be put in place. Electricity, uh, good road networks, the railways, where goods can be delivered to where they are needed most. Nigeria's over-dependence on importation continues to be a major problem for the country's economy. Chamun Dabing, Trust TV News, Abuja. The federal government through Smedan has reiterated its commitment towards building competitiveness of micro, small and medium enterprises in the country through collaborating with finance institutions to help entrepreneurs access finance to grow their business. The Director General of Smedan stated this at a forum for the One Local Government, One Product Initiative of the federal government to drive industrialization. Christiana Amodu tells us more. To help build the capacity of Nigerian entrepreneurs and also develop the rural economy, the Small and Medium Enterprises Development Agency is working with the private sector to provide affordable financing for MSMEs under the One Local Government, One Product Initiative. The initiative, which has been captured under the 2023 budget, comprises 30% grant and 70% loan to be repaid within stipulated time frame. The agency is implementing the one local government, one product program in 212 local government areas across the country. And it is the last phase of the first circle of 735 local government areas, as I earlier mentioned. It is hoped that the agency will have significantly impacted and impacted on the total of 774 enterprises in the 774 local government areas by the end of the 2022 budget year. Microfinance banks are to ensure that documentation, account opening for cooperatives is duly complete, completed and disbursement made on time. Also, participating cooperatives are expected to reciprocate the good intention of the federal government in terms of easing access to finance for MSMEs through the largesse of 30% grant on repayment, thereby leaving them with only 70% interest free as a loan which have to be paid within 18 to 21 months. Entrepreneurs present at the forum expressed optimism with regards to how this will impact their businesses. Well, um, with Smidan, it has been great. It has been great. Um, we participated in the first OLO program, which we were able to access funds for expansion of our company and our business. Uh, prior to the OLO program, which we participated in, we we are operating on a rather very small scale, you know. But then, after the funds were assessed, we were able to secure a space, even up to the extent of uh, building an establishment, and then pushing for more of our products. The federal government has implemented a program in 29 states and 774 local governments to drive industrialization and position Nigerian SMEs on the right pedestal in the African market. Christiana Amodu Otia, Trust TV News, Abuja. Now let's join Chiamaka Umafo for more business news. Nigerian carrier Dana Air has announced that it will resume flight operations on November 9 after a successful conclusion of the audit by the Nigerian Civilization Authority, NCAA. According to the statement released by the airline, the accountable manager and chief operating officer, Emamabong Etete, said the audit has repositioned them as a vibrant and resilient brand, also recommends it for all domestic airlines for the good of the industry. The airline said for customers with unused tickets, it has extended the validity for one year, and a transfer option is also available. Recall, in July 2022, the NCAA suspended Dana Air operations indefinitely 
over its alleged inability to run safe operations. And finally in stock, the Nigerian equity market on Friday closed bullish as the All Share Index rose by 0.07% to settle at 44,269.18 points from the previous close of 44,236.70 points. Investors' wealth climbed by 17 billion naira as the market capitalization was up by 0.07% to close at 24.112 trillion naira from the previous close of 24.095 trillion naira. The market broke close balanced as 14 equities appreciated in their share prices against 14 that declined in their share prices. An aggregate of 705.9 million units of shares were traded in 3,472 deals valued at 4.59 billion naira. And that's it on Business News. I am Chiamaka Mafo. Now for a look at the foreign scene where Cameroon's 89-year-old president, Paul Bia, will mark the 40th anniversary of his rise to power on Sunday. The Cameroon People's Democratic Movement, which Bia founded in 1985, says it will hold a big party up and down the country to mark the anniversary. Uh, Emmanuel Ngom, a member of the party's central committee, explained that festivities will celebrate political stability and peace which he says are the biggest successes of the last four decades in Cameroon. However, political scientist Professor Stefan Akoa says the anniversary celebrations aim to divert attention away from the crucial question, which is how healthy the president is. Bia is only the second president in Cameroon's history since the Central African nation gained independence from France. He is also Africa's longest-serving leader after Equatorial Guinea's Theodoro Obiang Nguema, who seized power in 1979. Meanwhile, Guinea's ruling junta is calling for the prosecution of former President Alpha Conde, who was overthrown in a coup in 2021. The ruling junta is also calling for the prosecution of some 180 senior officials and former ministers for alleged corruption. The military, which took power more than a year ago, has made the fight against corruption one of its major proclaimed battles, and many former officials have already been detained in this context. The Minister of Justice, Alphonse Charles Wright, in a letter to prosecutors listed those to be prosecuted, including the former head of state, ex-prime minister, and 188 others, some of which are already in prison and some mentioned severally. The letter further ordered prosecutors to pursue the listed persons for alleged illicit enrichment, money laundering, forgery, embezzlement of public funds and complicity. And now to sports where Alex Iwobi is set to become one of Everton's top earners with a new five-year contract being proposed by the club. According to reports, the former Arsenal midfielder has been offered a new five-year contract to stay at Everton. You will be joined the Toffees when under the management of Marco Silva for an initial fee of £28 million in the summer of 2019. Earlier in October, Lampard called him one of the best midfielders in the Premier League currently. Meanwhile, Leeds must pay RB Leipzig €21 million Euros after their appeal against the transfer of Jean-Kevin Augustin was dismissed by the Court of Arbitration for Sports, CAS. Leeds had appealed against FIFA's ruling in June that they must honour their purchase obligation for the striker, who joined on loan in 2020. CAS appealed CAF's FIFA's decision in its entirety and ordered Leeds to pay the first instalment of £5.9 million. The West Yorkshire club Augustin, signed Augustin on loan from RB Leipzig in January 2020 with an obligation to buy the Frenchman for €21 million Euros on a five-year deal if they secured Premier League promotion. The fee is due in three instalments. Augustin, who now plays for Swiss side Basel, struggled with fitness and injury during his time at Ellen Road, featuring for 48 minutes across three substitute appearances. Now let's join Mardia Umar for more sports news.
After several years of trying, Nigeria will for the first time officially unveil the World Handicap System, WHS, that will provide golfers in the country with a unified and more inclusive handicapping system. The WHS will enable golfers to transport their handicap index globally and compete or play a casual round with players from other regions and clubs on a fair basis. Other features include timely handicap revisions, a maximum handicap limit of 37 for men and 46 for ladies that will encourage more golfers to measure and track their performance and a consistent handicap that is portable from course to course and country to country. The Nigerian Football Federation, NFF, has warned the media from spreading news that could disrupt the organization and the Super Eagles coach, Jose Pizarro. The NFF said this after reports emerged that the organization owes Pizarro outstanding wedges. Pizarro took over as Nigeria's coach in May 2022, but the Portuguese tactician has not received his wages since his appointment. Pizarro will next be seen when the Super Eagles take on Costa Rica and Portugal in two international friendlies later this month. And the 2022 World Cup FIFA has written to 2022 World Cup participating teams, urging them to focus on the football in Qatar and not the sport to be dragged into ideological or political battles. The letter from FIFA President Gianni Infantino and the governing body's Secretary General Fatima Samora follows a number of protests made by World Cup teams. The protests were on issues ranging from LGBTIQ rights to concerns about the treatment of migrant workers. However, FIFA, which is a sports world the governing body was unable to provide immediate comment when contacted by Rogers. The World Cup, the first held in the Middle East, starts on November 20. World Cup organizers have said that everyone, no matter their sexual orientation or background, is welcome, while also warning against public displays of affection. And finally, Germany forward Timo Werner, who has scored nine goals in 17 appearances for club and country this season, will not be appearing in the World Cup in Qatar after suffering an ankle injury that will keep him out until 2023. The 26-year-old was withdrawn after 19 minutes of Ari Leipzig's 4-0 Champions League win over Shakhtar Donetsk on Wednesday. The former and with that, we wrap up Trans TV News Hour for tonight. Don't forget, you can subscribe to watch us live on YouTube and follow us across all our social media platforms. I am Ibrahim Yusuf. Thanks for watching.